We all go through different chapters in our lives, some stranger than others. Welcome to Strange Chapters, where we bring you true stories of the strange, the macabre, the paranormal, and the supernatural. So sit back, relax, and let's get to this week's featured author and their stories. Hey everybody, welcome back to Strange Chapters. I am your host and narrator, Eric Freeman Sims. Today we have stories of black-eyed kids from Jim and Jade's book, Danger at Your Door, Encounters with Black-Eyed Kids. And uh, Jim and Jade's books are available on Amazon, Kindle, BarnesandNoble.com, and wherever fine books are sold. So sit back, relax, and let's get strange. Story 1, Black-Eyed Kids in the Woods While it's true this particular phenomenon tends to happen in more urban areas, that's not to say that there aren't some really creepy encounters that have been reported by people who have come across these entities while out in the woods. Granted, it's also fair to say that you're more likely to see a white-eyed kid in the wilderness than black-eyed kids. But again, each isn't exclusive to only appearing in one place. It's more like your odds are lower to see the white-eyed kids on your doorstep and the black-eyed kids in the woods. It's so easy to make up a story about the black-eyed kids once you know the parameters. And so I took great care to use an encounter for this chapter that both really resonated with me and that seemed to have a little extra something that most people wouldn't think to include. I personally spoke to this young woman, and she is, in my opinion, a credible witness in every sense of the word. I trust her implicitly and believe everything she said to me. She chose to remain anonymous as this encounter happened back in the early 2000s, and she is still traumatized and devastated to this very day. She hasn't been hiking alone since and won't camp at all, even with a group of people. She is being treated for post-traumatic stress disorder and showed me proof of that fact. She simply cannot get over what she saw and lives in a state of perpetual terror that she will once again see the young boys that cause it all or other children just like them. Here's her story. This young woman says she was at a campground at the end of August in her home state of Maine. There was a lake there and before going to check in at the ranger station, she had a picnic by the lake, but realized quickly it was already too cold for her to swim. She cleaned up her mess and took a short 15-minute walk to the nearest ranger station to pay and check in, etc. She gave the ranger all of her information and got a backcountry pass because she knew that's where she intended to hike and camp for the entirety of her week-long visit to the park. She then walked from the ranger station back to her car to grab her gear. That's where things started getting really scary for her. As she approached her vehicle, she saw two little kids sitting on a bench directly in front of where she was parked, but at first she didn't think much of it. Though she didn't see any other people out there, she assumed they had come with their families and were waiting for them. It was broad daylight and still a few hours until the sun set, and so she really wasn't scared, despite admitting that she had a strange feeling of danger when she looked over at the kids that she tried to shake off. After all, the younger one was maybe 8 years old at most, and the older looking one couldn't have been older than 10 or 11. Not really too much to fear there, or so she thought. She smiled at the children, who before she approached her car, she heard engaging one another in a seemingly intense, whispered conversation that ended the minute they noticed her. The children didn't smile back, but continued to stare at her. She thought it was rude they didn't smile back, but then she considered maybe they were taught not to smile at strangers or something. Either way, it was no big deal, and she turned and walked away without giving it another thought. Our witness said she eventually found a very secluded and seemingly peaceful place to camp and built a fire. She had her tent set up quickly and ate some dinner. After everything was done, she was simply sitting in a chair by the fire and looking up at the stars. The chair reclined back, and she put it on the lowest setting so that she was lying almost completely flat on her back. She said she was fairly tired from the hike to the campsite and must have dozed off without realizing it. She was jolted awake by something she couldn't quite put her finger on, but the moment she opened her eyes, she saw the two kids staring down at her, whom she had seen earlier in the day sitting on the bench near her car. She screamed loudly and jumped up in her seat. She had to turn around in order to face the children, and right away she noticed their soulless black eyes. She told me that she specifically remembered thinking that word, soulless, the second she saw them. She didn't believe in the supernatural in any capacity, and had never had any sort of experience with anything that could even be remotely considered paranormal. But she knew she was in the presence of pure evil from the moment she saw those black eyes. Suddenly the kids didn't seem so harmless, and she was all too aware of how alone and vulnerable she was. Her rational mind tried to tell her to relax and that they were just a couple of kids who maybe were in trouble or had gotten lost. As soon as she had that thought, she said the elder of the two said to her, 
Relax, lady. We're just a couple of harmless kids. We need your help. Her blood ran cold. She tried to keep her composure and asked them, as calmly as she could manage, what they needed. She explained that she felt like, despite her fear, she really did want to help them. She thought she was a decent human being who wouldn't turn away a couple of kids who seemed lost in the wilderness and who needed her help just because there was something strange about their mannerisms and their eyes. However, after researching the phenomena, she realizes that she was more than likely being influenced to look past the eyes and general overall weirdness of those kids and that her initial instincts were somehow being overridden. The eldest boy spoke again while the younger one stood a little behind him, staring at his feet the whole time and shifting from one foot to another as if impatient. The older boy said that he and his brother were lost in the woods and needed to call their mother so that she could come and get them. The woman asked where their mother was and they told her she was at home. Our witness asked them how they had gotten into the woods in the first place without an adult, but the kids seemed to get angry at her questioning, and despite him only seeming to have one very monotone way of speaking, she could somehow sense she had struck a nerve. He didn't answer her and simply asked her again if she would help them because they were lost and had to call their mother to come and get them. Now, our witness was scared, and she was suddenly struck by how strange the situation was, and once again, she became very aware of how terribly vulnerable she was. She was in the backcountry and hadn't seen another human being besides those kids since she entered the forest. Would anyone even hear her scream? She was torn because she really wanted to help these little kids, but there was something inside of her that was telling her to run away from them and get as far away as she could and as quickly as possible. She tried to keep her voice upbeat and even toned. She told the boy that she was unable to help him because she had left her cell phone in the car and that she wouldn't got any service where they were anyway. She then suggested they walk to the ranger station or wait at the camp for her as she walked to the station for them. The words were out before she even realized what she was saying, and it dawned on her right then and there. Her intuition knew it was safer to walk through the woods alone to try and get help for herself and possibly for the kids too, so she wouldn't have to be alone rather than stay there with them or send them on their way, ended up not knowing where they were and if they were still watching her or not. Could it be they had been watching her the entire time since she had pulled into the parking lot of the park? That had to have been the case because there's no one else there when she hadn't been grabbing her gear. It wasn't possible the kids had been just playing a prank on her either. She thought about it and they would have to have been there before her because of the absence of anyone else being there when she started her trek through the woods. She hadn't spoken for a full minute as she had become lost in her own thoughts. The kid spoke again first and he informed her with a lot of authority in his voice for someone no older than 12 that she wasn't leaving them there and that they weren't going anywhere. He told her they were all going to walk back to her car and she was going to drive them home. The woman stood up quickly and told them there was no way in hell that that was going to happen and that they needed to get away from her camp and leave her alone. The kid smirked, but the smaller one in the back seemed to be looking around nervously until the one in the front, who had been doing all the talking, turned and looked at him. They stared unblinkingly at each other for a full two minutes before the older one turned back to her and began pleading with her to just help them. The young one began to cry in what was obviously a very fake and fabricated attempt to manipulate her with some tearless sobbing in order to get their own way. The woman became angry, despite how terrified she still was, and she screamed at them to get the hell out of there. The boy, who had been doing all the talking, once again told her that they weren't going anywhere and that they were going to walk with her to her car and she was going to be a good human and help out a couple of helpless and lost little kids. She said her blood once again ran cold as she said the last bit of this because he looked up at her and smirked again. It was a look that said so many things, but the main thing the woman gleaned from it was that she knew what they were and there was no way she was getting away from them. She turned and started running blindly through the woods and screaming at the top of her lungs. She ran nonstop for about 10 minutes before she fell. It was the middle of the night, dark, and she had been crying and shaking. She hurt her ankle and kept on screaming, despite the fact she knew she was in even more trouble than if the kids appeared because she didn't think her ankle would be able to run and there were other, more natural dangers in the forest, like wild animals. She was injured and couldn't get away if she had wanted to. There she sat, crying and in excruciating pain, on the forest floor and screaming bloody murder in the hopes that someone somewhere would hear her and come to her aid. She heard movement ahead of her and when she looked up, she started incessantly screaming as she thought she saw the boys coming towards her from the woods. It turned out to be one of the rangers who had received a report from someone else camping nearby that a woman was screaming in the woods. There must have been at least one other person out there with her after all. Our witness was hysterical, but eventually she calmed down enough to tell the ranger what had happened. He looked like he didn't believe her and asked if she had been drinking or using any drugs. Offended by the question, the woman went into hysterics again, but then, quite indignantly, she told him again what had happened to her. The ranger said that he had been driving by when she retrieved her things from her vehicle 
and he just happened to look over at her, and there hadn't been any kids anywhere near her, let alone sitting on the bench in front of where she had parked. She was incredulous, but as we learned a couple of chapters ago, it's not uncommon for some people to see them and others not to. Finally, after a few minutes, the ranger took pity on her and helped her back to her camp. He searched the perimeter, mainly just to appease her, and after making sure she felt safe enough to stay there for the night and that she didn't need medical attention for her ankle, he left her with the promise to come by and check later on in the night to make sure she was okay. It was 2 o'clock in the morning by the time all of this had happened and our witness was exhausted. She said she felt okay enough to stay one more night in those woods, but only because she didn't want to leave everything behind to go to the hospital for what she figured was just a nasty sprain in her ankle. She tried her best to sleep and kept the flashlight on and in her hand the whole night. Despite having nightmares about black-eyed kids terrorizing her and chasing her through the woods, she didn't actually ever see them again. She woke up a little later in the morning, packed up her gear, and left those woods as fast as she possibly could, considering her injury. She kept thinking she was going to see the kids sitting on the bench again, and a part of her hope that she did so that she could march over and tell the ranger that the kids were still there and she could prove it. However, the kids were nowhere to be found. One last interesting detail of this encounter is that as she pulled out of the parking lot of the camp, she thought she was hallucinating, seeing the two boys from the previous night, standing at the edge of the woods watching her, and as soon as she turned a corner and they were no longer in her sights, she heard a howl that sounded like some sort of animal was in pain. It was guttural, primal, and completely animalistic. After she was able to research the phenomena eventually, she learned that she more than likely wasn't hallucinating due to fear and that the boys were watching. They had not been a figment of her imagination after all, but in fact watched her drive away from the woods and had let out that inhuman scream when she turned that bend. Story 2. Wide-Eyed Kids One rainy night somewhere in the Midwestern United States, a man was sitting alone in his home, flipping through the channels, and trying to find something to settle in and watch after a double shift. He worked in a factory and therefore had been on his feet for an entire 16 hours and was beaten to hell and extremely tired. He had ordered pizza earlier in the evening and needed just a little more time to unwind before he went to bed for the night. It was around 1 in the morning. The only light in the house was the glow of the TV, and he certainly wouldn't expect any visitors. Suddenly, he started feeling dizzy and nauseous out of nowhere, and a feeling of intense dread came over him. He was sweating profusely, and he was shaking so badly, he dropped the remote out of his hands. He couldn't understand why he was feeling this way. He couldn't ignore it no matter how hard he tried, so he decided to get up and make sure he checked all the locks on the doors and made sure the windows and everything else were closed and locked up tight for the night. It was cold outside and dead of winter, so he'd already done this, but he simply could not deny the overwhelming feeling to get up and check just to be sure. He was only a few feet from the front door where he'd been lying on the couch, but he got up anyway. Something just didn't feel right. For reasons he couldn't explain, he felt very exposed and entirely unsafe in his own home. He had never felt like this before and was even more concerned because of that. He got up off the couch and made his way to the front door first, and as he did this, the hairs on the back of his neck stood up and for a moment he simply couldn't move. All he could do was stand there and stare at the door. As he did, there was a loud knock on it that all but shocked him out of this paralyzed state. He had several thoughts all at once when the knock came. The first was that there shouldn't be anyone knocking on his door at this late hour, and another was, why would someone be knocking instead of ringing the very obvious doorbell? He was still feeling very scared, and so it took him a moment to ask who was there. He walked up to look into the peephole, but before he finished the few steps, a voice started talking to him from outside on his front porch. Please, sir, may we come in? My little brother really needs to use your bathroom. The man was startled and somewhat stumbled back in horror. He didn't want whoever was out there to know that there was anyone home but it somehow seemed like they already did. After all, how did they know he was male and not a female? He was too terrified now to even look out of the peephole, but then he decided that's what he had to do because maybe there was some slight chance that someone was playing some sort of prank on him. That didn't make any sense at all, but neither did the whole situation. It would have been a lot less terrifying had he not had these primal sensations ripping through his body. The voice sounded confident and almost robotic. It also sounded a little bit like the voice of a child too. He summoned the courage to look in the peephole. There were two little kids standing out there on his front porch. At first, he could only see the tops of their heads, and they seemed to be looking down. He didn't get to take in much more before one of them looked up and stared directly into the peephole, as if he somehow knew the witness was there and looking at him. 
It was two young boys, and when the elder of the two looked up, there was nothing but black where his eyes should have been. Not black holes or anything, at least not literally. The child's stare penetrated into the man's very soul, and it smirked, somewhat as if it knew he was just terrified behind the front door. The young boy spoke again. This time he was much louder. Just let us in so we can call our mom. We're lost and just need her to come get us. The whole time he was saying this, he was staring unblinkingly into the witness's eyes and smirking. The man once again backed away from the door and covered his mouth with his hands to stop himself from crying out. He thought to himself, sweet Jesus, and the young boy's voice returned his thought with, you know he isn't real, right? The man then backed even further away. That last question from the demonic-looking child had been telepathic. The man yelled through the door that he was going to call the police if the kids didn't get off his property, but this only seemed to anger them. The oldest of the two, the one who had done all the talking up to that point, responded by pounding on the door. He demanded to be let inside and told the man that if he didn't invite them, they couldn't come in. The man seemed to have been snapped somehow out of his terror and went to go and get his gun. He was going to just fling the door open and threaten to shoot the kids if they didn't leave. He ran through the house to his bedroom and got his shotgun. He made sure it was loaded, and knowing there would be a locked glass screen door between himself and the demonic children, he swung his front door open and aimed the rifle. Before he could dial the police, he saw something he wasn't expecting. Where before there had been two small children with blonde hair and black eyes, there now was a girl who looked like she was in her late teens and early 20s, and she looked nothing like the other two. This young woman had a sense of peace and serenity about her, and she told him to lower the gun. He obeyed immediately and without thinking about it. Then she asked him where they had gone. Knowing exactly who the young woman was referring, the man responded. He told her that he didn't know and hadn't seen them leave. She looked at him, her pale skin and raven black hair made blacker by her pure white eyes. You'll never see them again, she said, and turned to walk away. The man thought to himself that he hoped she was right, and then did the strangest thing. He unloaded his gun and went to put it back. He only then went and locked his front door again and went back to lay on the couch as though nothing out of the ordinary had happened. He only remembered this in bits and pieces over the course of a few months. So what happened here? The thing is, I really don't know and there's no one out there who can tell you that they honestly do. I'm not even sure if there is a connection between the black and white-eyed kids, or if they are two completely different phenomena. It's not unusual for most encounters with the white-eyed kids to happen out in the woods somewhere, and the encounters usually consist of someone being compelled to do something they don't remember. This one, the one I just recounted for you all, is a rare occurrence, but I wholeheartedly believe that it happened. At first, I thought that perhaps the white-eyed kids were some sort of angels, but that was only because I hadn't gotten far enough into the research yet. While this one seemed like some sort of saving grace in this instance, it isn't always that way. The white-eyed kids, for example, oftentimes just seem to appear out of nowhere, and sometimes it's in your vehicle or your home. They don't seem to have to knock, and they definitely do not need your permission in order to enter. While the BEK are almost always in pairs or more, their white-eyed counterparts are always by themselves. While the BEK seem to always hang out in residential areas, and also like to loiter in parking lots, the WEK seem to prefer the solitude of the woods or lonely back roads. There is no intense and primal feeling of dread that accompanies the victim or witness into immediately being put off by the entity, but quite the opposite, and they seem to be lulled into a possible false sense of security from the moment they make eye contact with these wide-eyed entities. I say possible because we really don't know at this point. Even people who remember their encounters don't remember much, and even under hypnotic regression, there seems to be a lot of smoke and mirrors and downright illusions happening. There is usually some memory of seeing one and then being told to go and carry out something, with the something being the biggest mystery as there hasn't ever been a single report I've come across, despite my extensive research, where the person is able to remember what exactly they were asked or compelled to do. What is normally reported from the small amount of information that I've been able to gain through witnesses and victim testimony is that when the WEK appear in someone's presence, whether it be their home or tent in a campground or wherever else they should so desire, they do so and then stare, emotionlessly and unblinking at the person, never speaking or giving away the intent. The person they are doing this to feels nothing bad or different until, of course, they see their eyes. Otherwise, it's just a creepy encounter with a strange-looking kid. Creepy because of the unblinking and silent staring. After the initial encounter, when the W.E.K. suddenly appears, stares for a bit, then vanishes in the thin air just as quickly. The victim usually feels they're being followed, but can't see anyone in their midst. Also, they will find child-sized handprints on their windows and other surfaces where such things are most noticeable. 
like a mirror in the bathroom perhaps, or the window of the camper van. Compounding all the other high strangeness involving these encounters is that the handprints are normally those of children much younger than the one encountered with white eyes. These handprints are said to also vanish quickly, almost as fast as the children themselves. There has also been speculation that these creatures or beings, or whatever you want to refer them as, are messengers of death, allegedly being encountered more often than not before some tragedy or death. What does it all mean? I have no idea, yet. The fact is that once again, we just don't know enough. While some encounters do insist these white-eyed kids were begging to be let in, there's so much more information to the contrary. I believe they have much stronger magic. I use that word for lack of a better term here, mind you, and the K on the end is simply to distinguish between actual magic and what happens on the stage in front of an audience. I believe they are better able to control the humans. They communicate through mind control, yet I've not been able to find a substantial claim about what exactly they're trying to communicate. Now, I know that you're probably thinking, and that's when I say substantiated claim. Most people ask, how is any of this substantiated, Gemma? And yeah, I know, I'm just going by the way I feel in my gut. Admittedly, I'm no expert, but I think I'm on to something here. The term W-E-K, in my opinion, is a bit misleading, as when we use the term kid, or children, child. When referring to the black-eyed type, we usually mean they're ranging in age from looking around 3 or 4 up to the age of 17 or 18. In my research, I've come to find that the white-eyed varieties are usually older. Definitely kids as in teenagers, but not usually so young. In fact, almost never younger than 18 or so. If I'm right, and their brain works in the kind of the same way as humans, then perhaps they are more intelligent than their counterparts because of this. After all, nobody is giving any awards to the BEK for their vocabulary or communication skills, that's for damn sure. Although the WEK don't ever speak orally, they do communicate telepathically. Their voices will penetrate their victims' brains. I still haven't been able to find a single believable retelling where I can figure out what they are saying in these communications. What is their purpose? I just don't know. One more strange aspect to the white eye kid phenomena that I've noticed is that they almost always appear to people age 50 and above. I've yet to come across more than a handful of instances where a younger person has reported seeing one of these entities. The demon or angels of death thing makes some sense on the surface, but that's only because of the theory that they visit their victims or the witnesses, however you want to look at it, right before they die. They are possibly harbingers of death. Here's the thing. I don't see how anyone can make those claims when we almost never know for sure what happens to someone after they have one of these encounters. Even if it's happened in a handful of cases that someone who saw one of these entities or had a personal encounter with them pass away sometime after, how long after was it? Are we sure the white-eyed entity had anything to do with it? And if so, then how? There are too many unknowns there for me to even go near subscribing to the angel, demon, of death theory but I have been keeping my eyes on this particular phenomenon and hope to write more about it in the near future. Story 3. Halloween Encounters I thought it wouldn't be a complete book without mentioning the time of year when most people say the veil is thinnest. The truth of the matter is that the veil has been thinning for centuries, with Halloween being the time when it's most transparent. It should be noted the month of October reports the greatest number of paranormal encounters. Could it also be that because of everyone having the mindset that Halloween or Samhain is supposed to be scary, with everyone believing that it's one and only night of the year when the dead can freely walk the earth and roam among the living, it makes us all more prone to encounters. It also opens us up to see more than we normally would because not only are we looking for it, oftentimes we're expecting it. I wanted to mention this particular time of year not really because I have definitive proof that black-eyed kids make more house calls on the night of October 31st, but because it is possible that's the case, as I'm seeing more and more people come to me with their own Halloween encounters with them. How hard would it really be for one of those black-eyed devils to sneak around and walk amongst the little children, not reciting the usual trick-or-treat slogan, but instead pleading for help and playing on the heartstrings of the good-hearted adults and older children who are handing out candy and anticipating seeing all the little ones dressed up? I actually think Halloween would be the worst time for entities like the Black Eyed Kids to try and get to the homes of unsuspecting humans for the simple fact that there are so many people around, and as we've already learned here, their so-called glamouring or mesmerizing skills could really use some work. However, I want to enter these encounters here because I'm of the opinion that it's more proof of how brazen these things are and how they come in recent years to be so bold as to try and blend in with other kids dressed up. Our first witness said he noticed his neighbor, where he lived at the time in Southern California, hadn't put out any Halloween decorations that year. 
This was highly unusual because there was an unspoken contest in the neighborhood for who had the best, scariest, and most decorations out. The whole street was filled with homemade haunted houses, and everyone who lived there participated in the festivities, with some of them even starting to get everything set up for the big night early in September. The man mentioned to his neighbor that he'd better get cracking if he wanted to win whatever guy gift was in store for the winter that year. It was all in good fun. However, his neighbor didn't look amused at the suggestion, and in fact, the man looked horrified. He asked what was wrong, and his neighbor explained that he wouldn't be putting up decorations that year, and that he didn't think he wanted to participate in Halloween at all saying he was going to go to bed early and leave his house dark so no trick-or-treaters would come knocking or ringing his bell. The tradition of the decoration contest in this little community had been going on for decades, and even new people who moved in were made aware of it at the time of their closing. It was kind of a big deal. The neighbor explained that the previous year, he had a terrifying experience on Halloween night that he never wanted to discuss with anyone for fear he would be thought to have been losing his mind. Our witness was surprised but sympathetic and asked him for more details swearing himself to secrecy. The neighbor said the doorbell never stopped ringing, but he had more than enough candy, and like everyone else in the neighborhood, he really got into the spirit of things, even dressing up like a vampire to jokingly try and scare some of the older kids who stopped by. He figured he would give them a trick-or-treat, so to speak. The last stragglers of trick-or-treaters came around at 11.30, and our victim said he handed out the last of the candy and turned off his porch lights to signal that he was no longer welcoming anyone to ring the bell. In the quiet and mainly peaceful little community where he lived, he figured no one would come by that late at night anyway. He locked his front door and went upstairs to change from his vampire costume into his pajamas. He had to work the next morning and was about to call it a night. At around midnight, just as he had settled into the couch to watch some television, there was a loud and very persistent knock on his front door. He was somewhat shocked, considering the late hour, and wasn't planning on answering the door, figuring whoever it was would just give up and move on to the next house. He was annoyed that parents would allow their kids, even the older ones, to go and disturb someone at that hour, even on Halloween. The knocking turned into actual banging, and when he looked over his front door, it was vibrating. He went to the door, but before he could open it, he just stood there. A feeling of intense dread and doom washed over him. His hands were shaking and his palms were sweaty. He couldn't understand why he felt so terrified, knowing there was almost a 100% chance that it was just a couple of kids on the other side of the door. His shaking hand reached out for the doorknob to open it and tell them to go home, but before he could open the door, a voice spoke through it. We're lost, sir, and my little brother needs to use the bathroom. May we please come in and use your phone and toilet? The victim was stunned, not knowing how the children knew he was there or even that he was a man. It could have easily been a woman behind the door. He knew he hadn't made a sound but tried to push away the terror and uneasiness he was feeling. He looked through the peephole in his front door, and sure enough, there were two boys there. They were both looking at the ground, but they had on baggy, hooded sweatshirts and ripped up jeans. Their hair was dark brown, but he couldn't see anything about their faces. One of the boys was much taller than the other, and he swallowed his fear and opened the door, telling them that he didn't have any more candy and that it was too late for them to be out there alone anyway. The older boy of the two then looked up as the other one started to whine, almost as if on cue. Please, sir, invite us in. It's awfully cold out here, and my brother needs your toilet. I need to call our mother. We're lost and don't know what to do. The man knew something was wrong. It was 2013, and all kids had their own cell phones by the age of eight at that point. He was an elementary school teacher and knew that for an absolute fact. He saw the boy's black eyes and noticed that their skin was so pale it was almost translucent, with purple veins running up and down their faces and neck. They didn't look normal, somehow, and the eyes were absolutely horrifying. They also weren't in costume, except for what he thought were contacts, and so our victim thought the two boys were decoys, setting him up to be robbed. He nervously started to close the door when the younger boy, maybe six or seven years old, started whining very loudly. He was looking right at our witness and there were no tears, no facial expression of sadness or crying. It was like he was just mimicking the sound of crying. It was like when a little child hears a dog bark and tries to bark themselves. It was eerie and the black eyes were really creeping him out. The older boy, who looked about 15 or 16, put his foot in the door and looked up again at our victim. Invite us in. We can't can't come in unless you invite us. We're We're just kids. kids. Don't Don't you want to help help a couple couple of kids? kids? His voice sounded distorted and like there was more than one person speaking to him. He got the chills and all pretense of being friendly went out the window as something deep inside of him told him he needed to get as far away from those kids as possible. He slammed the door despite the kid's foot being there trying to block it and locked it behind him. He then ran upstairs to his bedroom and locked himself in there, listening the whole time and for hours afterwards to the incessant pounding on his front door. Finally, around three in the morning, it was quiet, and he went to his window and looked out. 
He didn't see anyone, but heard an animalistic wail, unlike anything he'd ever heard before. He went to sleep and had nightmares for weeks. I also came across another story, almost exactly the same, except it happened in Oregon, and it's one that you'll quickly be able to find if you were to look it up. As far as I know, the man we just discussed never got another visit, but I can't be 100% sure. Sometimes just talking about your own experience can bring them to you or the person you're discussing them with or telling them about. Let's go over one more that I found to push home my point that it doesn't seem to matter what day of the year it is or where you are in the world, the black eyed kids will be able to get to you. Perhaps they're specifically looking for you and therefore always know where you are and when you're at your most vulnerable and alone. Think about it. Wouldn't Halloween be perfect cover for creatures such as these? Isn't it supposed to be perfect cover for all manner of evil that lurks in the darkness of the night? and stalks the shadows of the streets on any given night of the year. On Halloween, we're more aware of it yet, paradoxically, less able to see it, because the evil can and does camouflage itself, and with everyone dressed up, it's hard to know what's real or what's a costume. I found this next encounter, as I find so many of them nowadays, on a website specifically designed for people to go and write about their encounters with all manner of evil and demonic creatures and entities, as well as for them to discuss those encounters with others who may or may not have had similar experiences. The woman said she had been handing out candy to trick-or-treaters all night, but that it had been slower than normal that year. At around 10 o'clock at night, she opened her front door to allow her dog, who we will name Cindy for the purposes of the story, out to do her business one more time before bed. Our witness's husband went to take a shower, and it should be said here that neither of them had ever heard of the phenomenon of black-eyed kids before, and so wouldn't have known what they were dealing with beforehand. This isn't a case where there's an obvious reason for them to have made a visit, but then again, That's the case most of the time. Our witness, who we will call Jackie, said that before she reached the door, there was a knock which startled her right away. She made her way to the door but noticed her dog, who she knew was waiting to be let out and should have been excitedly running up behind her, was instead cowering in a corner. It was behavior Jackie had never seen before in Cindy and it immediately worried her. The knocking at the door continued and saw the porch light was illuminating two small figures outside. Her front door had a large oval of obscure glass in the middle, and that's how she was able to see, somewhat, who was out there. They looked like two shadows. She looked closer and saw there was two children, but instead of being dressed in a costume, they were wearing what looked like normal clothing. Not only did their attire strike her as immediately odd, but she also found it concerning that two children, so young, would be out so late at night, seemingly unsupervised. The girl was no older than 11, and the boy no older than 7, and after peering out the window, all the while being sure to make no sound to alert the kids that she was even home, her fear was confirmed when she saw no one else around. Not only were there no adults around that could be responsible for these two kids, but there was no one and it was like her street had suddenly gone deserted. The little girl spoke to her through the door and asked to use the phone. She was polite and almost sounded cheerful, and yet for the moment she opened her mouth, Jackie felt a strange feeling in the pit of her stomach, telling her that something was very wrong. The girl spoke up again. Ma'am, may we please come inside and use your phone to call our mom? Jackie wondered to herself what 11-year-old didn't have their own cell phone in this day and age. Jackie asked if either she or her brother had their own phone, and the two looked at one another for several seconds, and it felt to Jackie like they were somehow silently communicating to one another. The girl spoke up again, telling Jackie that her phone's battery had died and she was unable to use it. She also mentioned that her little brother was very scared and that if they could just come in to use the phone, their mother would be there quickly to pick them up. Jackie was torn and admitted that there were two very different and distinct feelings at play inside of her as she stood there thinking about what she should do next. She said, I have to admit there were two competing feelings going on inside me. The first, that of a mother's heart that wanted to help these two small children get to their mom. The other, a sinking fear in my gut that was keeping the other feeling at bay. It was then I noticed that during the short conversation, I'd already opened the door a few extra inches which I was completely unaware of doing. I stopped. Honey, why don't you give me your mother's number and I can call her myself. Another pause and they again looked at one another. After a short moment, they turned back to me and the girl said, Ma'am, my little brother has to use your bathroom. Can we please come inside while you call our mom? With that last statement, the little girl moved closer toward the door like she was going to just walk on in by me. As the little girl started walking past our witness, she stepped into the light. No doubt inadvertently at this point, and Jackie was able to see her eyes for the first time. She said her maternal instincts were silenced immediately by a terror unlike anything she had ever felt before in her life. The hair on the back of her neck and arms stood up, and she closed the door where she was only and barely able to stick her face out to speak to the kids. 
The little girl stopped in her tracks, and then Jackie said of what happened next. She again pleaded, Please, ma'am, we're really scared and alone out here. We have to come inside. Please help us. Then, like on cue, both kids began to whimper and cry. That's when the fear took over, and I shut and locked the door. I'll call your mom if you give me the number, I shouted through the door, but I'm not letting you in my house. I could still see them standing there on the porch, just staring at me through the beveled glass pane. Part of me wanted to run upstairs to my husband, but the bigger part didn't want to lose track of where they were. That would have freaked me out even more to not know where they were. After what seemed like forever, but probably only a few seconds, I decided I'd call my neighbor across the street. As I made my way to the side table by our couch to the phone, I glanced back at the door. Cindy was nowhere to be found. We later found her in the guest room under the bed. When I got to my phone and started looking for his contact info, it was only then the kids stepped away from the door and began to walk to the street. As the kids made their way off the front porch and toward the street, Jackie walked to the door to see where they were going and if they were with anyone else. She couldn't see them clearly because the glass was fogged, but could see enough to see they were now under a street light, the one closest to her house, and they were staring at her. They weren't just staring at the door in the general direction of the house, but it was like they were looking right through the door and could see Jackie standing there watching them. Jackie lifted the phone to her ear to call her neighbor, and only then did the kids move away from her house. She went to look for a dog as she put her coat on to go outside to meet the neighbor. Her neighbor across the street had agreed to meet her under that same street light where the kids had just been standing, and in the two minutes it took her and her neighbor to get out there, the kids had seemingly vanished in the thin air. Could this have been the case of young kids out to trick some adults and only have some Halloween fun? Or is it just another example of how the black-eyed kids and all sorts of other demonic and evil creatures and beings use Halloween as a cover and to have more of a chance to be allowed their coveted entry into people's homes? We may never know, but as I always say, it's good to at least be informed and to have the questions in our minds rather than to be completely oblivious to what's happening around us. The thought of the black-eyed kids has always terrified me, personally, and with Halloween approaching too, I find myself staying indoors after dark and not wanting to even spend too much time working on this book after the sun sets. All right, thank you all for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed these three stories from Jim and Jade's book, Danger at Your Door, Encounters with Black Eyed Kids. I think this phenomenon is creepy, and these stories kind of creep me out even, even reading them. So... You can pick up Jim and Jade's books, all of her books, including the Black Eyed Kids books, the two Black Eyed Kids books, and her Missing the Faith Theory, as well as her new books, Campfire Stories, over on Amazon, Kindle, and wherever fine books are sold. And those links are in the show notes. Also, if you want to hear more about Black Eyed Kids, go over to the Unseen Paranormal Podcast and listen to my interview with Jim and Jade, and uh, where we break down Black Eyed Kid phenomena and tell some stories that you didn't hear here today. So until next time, y'all stay safe out there and stay strange.